Chapter 21 It was midnight before they got back from the emergency room. Thankfully, the bump was just that, a bump with a very slight concussion that would not be a problem. Because of lack of sleep and the emotional day, Maggie was completely exhausted by the time they laid the kids down and made it out into the hallway. She didn't even have the sanity to make a fast getaway. Maggie, Keith said softly when they were standing at her door. I wanted to tell you thanks. She turned to him incredulously. Thanks? For what? For trusting me enough to tell me. For coming to tell me the first time it happened. I just wish I had been there. Gently, he pulled her to him, and his arms were the best place she'd ever been. He felt so safe and so indescribably stable. I meant what I said about calling me if you ever need anything. His embrace fell away, but his hands found her arms. He lowered his gaze to hers. Okay? She nodded, but couldn't be fully certain this wasn't just some nice dream she had somehow fallen into. Now, get some sleep. You look exhausted. Yeah, she tried to laugh it off. After not getting back until like three in the morning last night, I feel like I've lived six days in one today. Concern slashed through Keith. Why didn't you get back until three? In the next second, he knew he shouldn't have asked as why smacked into him. Oh, you know, those cab drivers have a racket going, she said, laughing again. But Keith wasn't laughing. Cab drivers? What happened to Greg? She shrugged and let her gaze find the darkness at her feet. He was drinking. If she was trying to make him crazy, it was definitely working. Maggie, why didn't you call me? Because it was three in the morning. She laughed softly even as her hand came up to her other arm. Besides, what was I going to say? Hi, Keith, it's me. My date is over. Come get me. Irritation scratched through him. Well, that would have been better than you riding alone in some cab all over the countryside in the middle of the night. The overpowering need to protect her jammed into his chest. Now, you listen to me. I do not want you calling cabs to take you home in the middle of the night ever again. Annoyance flashed through her eyes as her gaze jerked up to his. You're not my father. Besides, how else was I supposed to get home? Walk? No, you were supposed to call me. She sighed, and it was obvious she was tired. Look, Keith, I don't want to argue, especially about this. He corralled his own emotions. Yeah, okay. We can talk about this tomorrow. Go get some sleep and don't set your alarm for in the morning. I'll cover for you. Panic slid through her face. For breakfast? He smiled. And lunch and dinner, the way you look. He lifted his chin. Now go get some sleep. Saturday, Maggie slept in and it was like the best vacation ever. They spent most of the rest of the day together, except for the time Keith had to run to the stables to check on things. Isabella was feeling better, at least she was playing now. At dinner, they talked about everything and nothing in particular. It was strange to Maggie how easy Keith was to be with, so unlike Greg, who seemed to be more show than substance. By the time they tucked Peter in and said their prayers, Maggie found herself wishing this never had to end. So, are we going to church tomorrow? Keith asked as she made it to her door. Bright and early. She opened her door. You know, Dad and Vivian will be back tomorrow. Something in his voice stopped her. We have to tell them. You know that, right? Dread slid through her. He was right, and she knew it. However, nothing in her wanted to face them with this information. I think we should do it together, he said slowly, if you want me there. Maggie turned. His presence filled the space between them. He was there, gazing into her eyes with concern and hope. I don't want to get you into trouble. And you don't deserve to be in trouble, 
So, if we both go... Are you sure? Very. Church flew by, and in no time they were out at the stables so Keith could check on things. There was no reason for them to be there, really, other than neither Maggie nor the kids wanted to see him go. At the stables, they got out of the pickup and walked to the barn, Maggie holding Izzy in one arm and Peter's hand with her other hand. This won't take long, Keith said. A young woman dressed in faded jeans and a T-shirt strode out of the barn. She had long blonde hair, and she was shorter even than Maggie by several inches. Oh, Mr. Ayer, she said, putting her hand up to block out the sun. I didn't know you were coming. Tanner said I was supposed to feed them. I just wanted to make sure you remembered, Keith said with a smile. Then his glance chanced to Maggie. Oh, Jamie, this is Maggie. He put his hand on Maggie's back, and her pulse jumped into a higher gear. Hi, Maggie. Jamie stuck out her hand, and Maggie shook it. Hi. And this is Isabella and Peter, Keith said proudly. It's nice to meet you. Jamie stepped up and stuck her hand out to Peter. You're a cutie. He smiled slightly. Jamie ruffled his hair. Then she stood and looked at Isabella, who was curled on Maggie's chest, sucking her thumb. And you are adorable. Jamie ran her hand gently over Isabella's curls. It looks like somebody could use a nap. Keith nodded. Maybe we should head on back to the house since Jamie's got this under control. No problem, Jamie said, stepping away from them. Y'all take care. We will. They walked to the pickup. She's nice, Maggie said. Tanner's girlfriend. She's helping out a little to make some gas money. Maggie nodded. Well, Tanner has good taste. I'm glad to see him with someone so nice. He deserves it. The rest of the afternoon, they stayed in the air conditioning of the mansion. Isabella didn't need to be out in the heat, and neither of them really wanted to be either. So they spent the afternoon in the kids' rooms, playing, wrestling, reading, and resting with the kids. It was nice to have a day to just do nothing. However, the reprieve couldn't last. When the Ayers announced their return downstairs, Keith looked at Maggie, and she knew it was time for the Inquisition. You ready? he asked. Had there been a way to say no, she would have. Instead, she nodded, and with him holding Izzy and Maggie's hand in Peter's, they walked out. Down the stairs they went, trooping one behind the other as if marching into enemy territory. Welcome home, Keith said, far too happy and normal sounding for Maggie to match. Well, it looks like it's still standing, that's something, Mr. Ayer said gazing at them as they made their descent. We won. Cumaine ran a great race. That's great, Dad, Keith said. Really great. Mr. Ayer nodded and smiled happily. I think I'll give Ike a raise. He deserves it after that one. Hello, Peter. Vivian reached down and gave her son the obligatory hug. Did you have a good time? Uh-huh. We went to see the horses today. Horses. Isabella said, but there wasn't much of a squeal. Maggie looked down at her. No, the bouncy child of a week ago still hadn't returned. For an awkward moment, no one said anything. Then Keith exhaled ever so slightly. Dad, Vivian, we need to talk. Mr. Ayer's face went ashen with the tone in Keith's voice, and suddenly Maggie knew why. Um, it's about the children, sir she said, before he could misconstrue Keith's intentions any further. Can't this wait, Vivian whined. We just got home. No, I'm afraid not, Keith said. It's pretty serious, and we wanted you to know what's been going on as soon as you got home. Mr. Ayer looked more confused than displeased. Could we go into your office, Keith said, and his father nodded. I'll let the kids with Inez for a minute. Maggie said, grateful that she didn't have to follow them all down the hallway. She took the kids to the kitchen and told Inez she would be back. It took everything she had to walk down that hall. When she slipped into the room, 
Keith was waiting for her at the door. He guided her to one of the mahogany wood chairs covered in expensive black leather. He sat next to her, his parents on the other side of the desk. Keith cleared his throat. We wanted you all to know that we found a bump on Isabella's head on Friday night. It was pretty good-sized, and we took her to the emergency room. A bump? Vivian asked incredulously. What from? Keith glanced at Maggie and then leveled his gaze on his father. We managed to get the story out of Peter. It seems that the fill-in babysitter yanked Isabella and made her slip. She fell and hit her head on the tub, causing the bump. We filled out a report on her at the hospital. It's standard. But she's been our fill-in for years, Vivian said. She wouldn't. It wasn't the first time. Maggie pulled in a breath and let out her fear. She hurt Peter the last time she was here. I saw the bruises on his arms. He told me she shook him really hard. He's terrified of her. But, Vivian started. Mr. Ayer folded his hands on the desk. Are you sure about this? Keith never flinched. There's no doubt. They walked out together so his parents could discuss the situation. With her arms wrapped at her chest, Maggie walked slightly in front of him, not saying a word. Are you okay? he asked with concern. I just hope they don't think I did it. Peace flowed through Keith. Dad's smart enough to know we were telling the truth. They got to the front door and Keith stopped. Well, I guess this is where I get off. She spun toward him. You're leaving? He grinned and winked at her. What, did you think I was going to stay forever? Sadness went through her. A girl can hope, can't she? Mrs. Haga has been notified that her services are no longer needed, Patty Ann said stridently. So until further notice, you are on duty. I understand, Maggie said, nodding. The secretary's office seemed even colder today. That means you are not to even consider asking off until we have cleared someone new. Yes, ma'am. And just so you know, that may not be any time soon. Why did this feel like a sentencing session? Don't worry about it. I don't plan on going anywhere any time soon anyway. Monday night, Keith drove into Houston. There were some things that needed to be said face to face. He climbed the steps to the second floor apartment and knocked. Putting his hand on his hip, he waited, rehearsing what he had come to say, just as he had been for all of 24 hours. Keith! Greg sounded happy to see him when he opened the door. Come in, buddy. This is a surprise. I thought you must have forgotten where I live. No, just haven't had much time to make the trip recently. Greg walked into the kitchen. Can I get you something, bud, Coors? The thought made Keith ill. Uh, no thanks, I'm driving. From the refrigerator, Greg checked him with a disbelieving look. Never bothered you before. Greg laughed as he brought one into the living room for himself. Keith sat down on the couch. His gaze went to the coffee table as fuzzy memories of games of quarters drifted aimlessly through him. The parties were legend, and yet they didn't hold the amusement they once had. He retrained his gaze to his friend. So what brings you all the way down the mountain? Well, Keith said, shifting slightly, this is probably not my place, but I have to say something because it's going to drive me crazy if I don't. Greg took a drink. Sounds serious. It is. Keith paused to gather his courage. It's about Maggie. Maggie? Greg's head snapped up incredulously. It took another breath to get the words out. Do you know about her, well, her growing up? She said she grew up in Del Rio. Keith watched Greg take another drink. Did she tell you why? Greg shrugged. I don't know, because she liked Del Rio? It was all Keith could do to keep himself from knocking Greg flat. No, because she was an orphan. 
Across the room, Greg's face fell with a can. She grew up in the foster care system. Her parents died in a car accident when she was eight. Concern slid over Greg's features. I don't... Why didn't she tell me this? It gets worse. Keith knew this was betraying every confidence she'd ever trusted him with, but he had to say it, had to get Greg to understand so he would stop being an idiot and hurting Maggie. They were hit by a drunk driver. A drunk... Greg looked down at the can and thought for a long, long minute. That's why. Yeah. Keith's place in this situation had been left so far behind, it was no longer even in the rearview mirror. Look, I don't want to step on any toes here, but her riding out into the boondocks in some cab for an hour by herself is not exactly safe. I told her she could call me, but I don't think she'll do that. Greg shook his head. Is she, is she mad at me? No. It killed him to say that. What he wanted to do was to lie and ruin every chance they had together. But he couldn't do that to Greg or to Maggie. I just thought you should know, that's all. Yeah, yeah, man. Thanks for telling me. His heart wouldn't let him go without saying it, but the words were pulling emotions from the center of him. Treat her right, Greg, okay? She's been through hell already, and she deserves better. Yeah, Greg nodded in understanding. Okay, I will. Well, are you going to congratulate us or what? Ike asked, walking into the office Tuesday morning. Keith barely looked up from the paperwork. Congratulations. Gee, you sound so happy. I would have thought you'd be bouncing off the walls for joy. I am, inside. He sounded as surly as he felt. The talk with Greg hadn't made him feel any better. If anything, it had made him feel worse. We won, you know, Ike said, sitting on the other side of the desk. I heard. You behave yourself while we were gone? Keith stood, tired of this conversation. I was an angel, just like always. He grabbed his hat and stalked to the door. Time to get some real work done. Don't burn the place down while I'm gone. Ms. Montgomery, Inez said, long after the sun had gone down on Wednesday. Phone call. Already tucked in for the night, Maggie dragged herself out of bed. Isabella was recovering, and they were back to a modified lesson schedule. It was already getting old. She tramped down to the kitchen and picked up the phone. Hello? Maggie, it's Greg. Oh, hi. She sat down on the chair. Somehow, she had hoped he wouldn't call back after the last episode. What's up? Listen, I think we need to talk. I'm really sorry about the other night. I was out of control, and I'm sorry. She was tired of this conversation already. She was tired of trying to make herself like him in a way that she just didn't. Hey, it happens. No, I was a total jerk, and you have every reason to hate me. I don't hate you, Greg. I just like to take things slower than that. But I shouldn't have made you ride home in the cab again. It won't happen again, I swear. Don't worry about it. Riding home wouldn't be a problem because she wasn't planning on going out with him again. He hesitated. Well, I was wondering if you wanted to go out tomorrow night. Disbelief slammed into her. Oh, Greg, I can't. We've had an impossible week around here. Isabella got hurt when I was gone last time. But couldn't they get someone else to watch them, just for a while? No, I don't think so. Dinner, just dinner. No, really. Pre-dinner, for drinks, or coffee, or whatever. Maggie laid her head on the table. No, it's just not going to work, Greg. Maggie, please don't give up on us because I was a jerk. Please. Us? It sounded like a death sentence. It's not because of that, really. It's just that they haven't hired a backup babysitter yet. What happened to the one they had? 
Long story. Listen, I've got to go. But he didn't sign off. Can I call you again sometime? She wanted to say no. With everything in her, she wanted to say no. But he sounded so crushed, she just couldn't. If you want. Saturday night, Keith got the call he had been dreading all week. After his talk with Greg, he had thrown himself into his coming life with Dallas like a good, soon-to-be groom should. However, just because he was committed didn't mean he was happy. I wanted to make sure we're going to be able to take the jet, Dallas said, clearly stressed out. I've got to be out of here by the 15th, one way or the other. Oh, he said, hearing the yelling already. Dad's going up to Amarillo that weekend. He's taking it. But I'm scheduled for the Friday night flight on American. Dallas sighed. Fine, I'll tell Rachel. She sounded tired. Have you checked into any more houses? I called the realtor yesterday. We're scheduled to go looking next Tuesday. She's got five houses to show us, including two of the ones we looked at online. Well, there's something. She sounded only vaguely impressed. How about the job search? Have you found anything yet? I posted my resume on three sites online, but I haven't heard back from anyone yet. This felt like work. Why did he have to have another job? I checked with a caterer, too. They are a go. Okay. You sound stressed. Huh. I wouldn't know why. I've got two more finals, and packing, and moving, and the wedding... Keith's heart sank, knowing he was the cause of a good portion of her stress. Tell you what, when you get here, you can take a mini vacation. No finals, no stress. It sounds wonderful. It will be. Sunday morning, it was all Keith could do to keep himself from running up the front steps. He hadn't seen Maggie in what felt like forever, and as crazy as it was, the thought of being with her, even for a few short hours, was all that was keeping him going. He opened the front door and slipped inside. His heart was pounding so loudly, he was sure it was audible in the quiet of the house. He turned toward the kitchen, where he found Inez washing breakfast dishes. Morning, he said. Oh, good morning. Miss Montgomery said she'd be down shortly. She's getting the children ready. Dad... And Vivian? They had a luncheon in Galveston this morning. They'll be back later. He nodded, just as Maggie and the kids appeared at the bottom of the stairs. He had never seen a more breathtaking sight. Morning, he said softly. Hi, sorry we're late. No problem. You ready? Guess so. Keith couldn't get his mind to forget that this was probably their last Sunday together. Next week, he would be in Vermont, and the week after that, Dallas would be here with him permanently. The thought threatened to overload his brain circuits, so rather than fry anything, he simply shut them off. He wouldn't think about Dallas or anything else in his other life today. For these few hours, he was Keith Ayer, the real Keith Ayer and for the time he had left, he was determined to soak in as much life as possible, because on the other side of this hour lay the death of him. He stood next to her in the pew, wishing this was real, wishing it never had to end, wishing it could be a future with her he was looking into. Welcome, everyone, to our service this May 7th. The rest of the greeting subsided into a swirl of confusion. The 7th? May 7th? Keith's mind wound through and around that date. It had been 17 years. 17 years today that his mother had died. How could he have forgotten? His heart slid through the thought. He hadn't even thought about it until now. Somehow, that hurt as much as the date did. The service started, but he didn't really hear it. It was as if in one breath he was back with her, a young boy enthralled with the world. Her soft voice flowed through him like it hadn't in so many, many years. He closed his eyes and soaked in the feeling of her. He was a man now, 
but when he thought about her, he was once again twelve, and ten, and five, asking her questions, begging for her knowledge of the world and her understanding of his place in it. She had always been able to make things right, with a kiss, a hug, a word of encouragement spoken at just the right moment. Peace, calm, joy. Those were the things he remembered about her, and now she was gone. Yes, she had been gone for many years, but in truth he had never let himself feel her absence until this very moment. Softly, he let his heart whisper, I miss you, Mom. I miss you so much. It's been so long. Suddenly, at his side, Peter reached up and slid his little hand into Keith's big one, and Keith opened his eyes and smiled down at the child. Love, so strong it ached, flowed through Keith. Yes, his mom had left, but if she hadn't, he wouldn't have Peter nor Isabella. He looked over to Maggie, holding his little sister, and the picture they made seared through him. If his mother had never left, he wouldn't have either of them. It wasn't that he would have chosen one over the other. It was more that only now could he see that even in the pain, there were some blessings. Mom, I never wanted you to leave. I've missed you so much. But these blessings, I was missing the blessings that are here that I wouldn't have had if the accident hadn't happened. He let his eyes fall closed. God, I'm so lost here. I feel like I know what I want, and yet it's like I can never have that. Please help me to let them go, to let Maggie go. I made a commitment to Dallas, and I've got to keep it. Please help me. In what seemed only moments, the service ended. He hadn't heard a word anyone had said. He followed Maggie out and to the pickup. However, when they were all strapped in, he glanced over at her. Would you mind if we make a little stop? She shrugged. No, that's fine. He nodded. The last time he had been to the graveyard was when his grandmother had died five years before, but he'd never had the courage to visit his mother's grave. Never. It had always seemed so final. But today, he would face it. Today, he would face the tragedy that had defined his youth so he could move into the tragedy that would define his future. What Maggie had expected she didn't know, but the graveyard was not it. What's going on? she asked in barely disguised panic as he turned into the parking lot gate. I just want to make a little visit while we're here. Now? she wanted to scream. Today of all days? It was like fate was playing some kind of cruel trick. Gathering herself so that she wouldn't completely lose it in front of him and the kids, she got out of the pickup and unstrapped Isabella. However, it took everything she had to get her feet moving toward the walkway when Isabella was in her arms. What is this? Peter asked, and Keith gave him some answer she didn't hear. Walk. Keep walking. Don't think. Fighting not to let the memories overwhelm her, Maggie walked with him through the small, wrought-iron archway and past five rows of headstones. There, Keith turned to the left, and Maggie followed, pleading with God to not drag this out any longer than it had to be. It brought back too many memories of another graveyard, half a state away. Halfway to the far fence, Keith stopped, and even in her anguish, Maggie saw his. He seemed not to be able to face what lay in front of him as his head was back and his eyes were closed. I miss her so much. Maggie stepped over to him and put her hand on his upper arm. I know. Believe me, I know. At that moment, she glanced down at the headstone, and reality scattered. Oh, my. That brought Keith's senses back to him with a snap. He looked over at her, concern and grief whiplashing their way through him. What, Maggie? What is it? She stood, staring at the headstone, her hand over her mouth. 
It was as if she had frozen in place right there. Fear drove into him. Maggie, what's wrong? She, they... Maggie was shaking her head as horrible thoughts went across her face. Then she looked at him in blank disbelief. They died the same day. He wasn't following. What? Who? It was all she could do to get the words out. My parents and your mom. They died the same day. This has been Deep in the Heart, written by Stacy Stallings. Narrated by Becky Dowdy of Brave Hearts Audiobook Productions. Copyright 2010 by Stacy Stallings. Production Copyright 2014 by Stacy Stallings. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel so you never miss a second of the story.